Okay. So welcome everyone to the fourth set of the Climate Resource Management and Human Development Community Resilience Initiatives in Asia 2020 webinar series. Our session today is broadcasted live on the of the coastal cities at risk in the Philippines at the nearest screens. Please be guided by the house rules for today's session. Our attendees and all attendees and participants must mute themselves upon entry and turn off their videos. The ceremony will be recorded for, for documentation purposes. For our distinguished speakers, please keep your videos off and your microphone muted, especially if it's not your turn to speak. For, us, for our speakers as well, you'll be hearing my voice when you only have three minutes left. For our attendees, please send your questions through the chat box at the bottom of your screen so our team can note this and raise it during our open forum. For our listeners on Facebook, you can send in your questions by the comment section. We begin this webinar with opening remarks from our main convener, Dr. M. Porio, who is also a professor at the Ateneo de Manila University's Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the project leader and principal investigator of the Cigar PH project. We now welcome Dr. M. Porio. Oh my God. Um. Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to the session four of the Climate Resource Management and Development Lecture Series with special focus on community resilience initiatives in Asia 2020. In behalf of Roberto Yap, CICAR PH project holder and president of the Ateneo de Manila University, and my partners at the Departments of Sociology, Anthropology, and the Political Science Department, let me welcome you to this uh, fourth session of our webinar series. We organize this webinar series specifically for the Asian Peace Builder Program Scholars who were supposed to be here with us before the COVID lockdown, but because of the COVID lockdown, uh, some of them are still in Costa Rica, while the others have re re returned to their respective countries in Japan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Vietnam, Indonesia, Cambodia, and the Philippines. So um, thank you very much. We would like to welcome those who have also joined us in Facebook Live. Thank you for being with us in all our seminars last week and yesterday. So we would like to thank basically the generosity. I think this webinar series is possible because of the generosity of our partners at the National Resilience Council, as well as the National uh, Innovation Center, as well as an environmental science program of the Ateneo. So let me tell you that when we were planning uh, when, when Dean Nandi and the uh, political science department and I were planning this, um, this course, how do we deliver this course on natural resource management and human development field applications? In June, we thought in November, we can take you, uh, the scholars, to Capsidan's um, initiative in Blue Ridge. Buklod Tao Katatagan uh, Resilience Initiative to the Valenzuela uh, group of uh, green, uh, greening program initiative and all the other partners that you have. But as I told you, COVID had different plans. It's now November and we're still on lockdown. So we prepared this, um, this series showing the community resilience initiatives in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Japan, and other so thank you very much. I would uh, thank our, especially our, uh, they, are, they come from very distinguished backgrounds. For example, uh, Esther, our board scholarship program in South I've been teaching long, and I 
more when my students came back here. And Captain San, um, I, I met him, I met her when um, she was acknowledged by the Congress of the Philippines as you know the Congress done a lot of the this stress reduction initiative. Um, without much ado, I'd like to hand you over to our speakers who will share with you their vast um, experiences in doing community resilience um, in, uh, initiatives and the others. So thank you very much. I would like to, in closing, I'd like to thank the and Bill here with us for their patience in terms of how we are adjusting our delivery courses in this digital digital um, from the box. It's really exciting and then I've learned a lot from all the speakers as my students. So um, let me thank again our speakers, the previous ones and all the current ones for them as the their knowledge, their wisdom, and how they do initiate and foster our viewers and to our listeners in F Live and in the Zoom. Thank you very much for being with us. Tomorrow we will have the Econ panel of Professor Chayan Bonapati of the Chiang Mai Resource Center University. And then we will also have um, Sri Wongdo of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, and also uh, from the International River, Spianarn and Deputy. Okay, so thank you very much, and you take it from here. Thank you very much, Dr. Porio. Now we start with our lecture by calling our first guest speaker, Barangay Captain Esperanza Castor Lee, or Capsesan, who will discuss BREATHES, which stands for Blue Ridge Environmental and Agricultural Template for Health, Economy, and Security. Capsesan is the Barangay Captain of Barangay Blue Ridge B, District 3, Quezon City, Philippines. Let us now welcome Cap Sesan. Morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Cap Sesan Castro Lee, um, the Punung Barangay of uh, Blue Ridge B. Before becoming a Punung Barangay, I've had more than 30 years of work, ex corporate work experience, and um, all the things that I've learned in the from the corporate world were applied now to the local government in my barangay. I've lived in Barangay Blurich B for more than 54 years already. So it's a community I love so dearly and would like to take very good care of, okay? So Ina, do I start now? Yes, Cap, go ahead. Okay, so I'll start to share my screen. Okay. Okay. So can you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay, so because um, so my topic is on community in resilience initiatives in Asia, and we're very proud to share our experience in Barangay Blue Ridge B. Again, I'm Cap Sesan. My presentation will have lots of photos, but uh, I will be going fast because of the time limit. You do not need to re check out the details of the photos. It, I just presented them there just to prove to you that the things that I am discussing really happened and they are real, okay? So I have 15 minutes, okay? So just two slides on... Uh, it's not... Ina, it's not moving. Yes. Okay, there, okay. Just two slides on the political structure of the Philippines. Uh, the barangay is the smallest unit of government in the Philippines. We start with the national, regional, provincial, city or municipal, and then you have the barangays, which is at the grass, grassroots level. We are the frontliners of the government for various services. We have executive 
executive, legislative, and judicial powers. Specific to Barangay Blue Ridge B, this is the map of Quezon City. And Blue Ridge B is that small white, yellow spot at the bottom right. Compared with the 142 barangays of Quezon City, Barangay Blue Ridge B ranks very low. We're almost at the bottom in terms of land area, population, and budget. But in terms of performance, we're very proud to say that we, rank, we rate very well. We are one of the first nine to be drug cleared out of 142 barangays. We are also a consistent winner in the solid waste manage, in solid waste management in Metro Manila. We placed second in disaster preparedness in Quezon City. We are rated as one of the 10 safest barangays in Quezon City. And again, currently we are number two with the lowest COVID cases in Quezon City. So this is our barangay hall. So Ms. Emma, you might be surprised. You went to visit an old dilapidated barangay hall. So this is our new barangay wow. hall. Wow. Yes, so where we moved into just last May, 2020, just this year, just last May, in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. Such a big contrast, Mrs. Sun. Yes. So Barangay Blue Ridge B also sits on the West Valley Fault. So that is the, the fault which is expected to cause the big one. So our disaster preparedness is really for the big one, for an earthquake. So we presented our disaster preparedness plan to Congress and also to the class of uh, Ms. Emma last year in Ateneo. We want our objectives to be very simply stated so that people can easily understand it. And these are defined to lead to resilience. So the first is in times of disaster, we want to survive. Second is that we want to be in a position to help. Third is we want to provide some comfort under miserable conditions. And then fourth is to be ready to, be, to rebuild. The photo shows our um, blue drops, which is part of our disaster preparedness. Our plan to build up community resilience was tested unexpectedly when COVID-19 came. So what did we do? First, and this is the most important. The barangay immediately became the strong voice in the community. Flashed on the screen is our mobile phone number. It's 6391718222272. If you read it, it is 6391718222. The beautiful barangay Blue Ridge B. Okay. So from that mobile phone, we've sent out text blast messages, which are official, factual immediate and inclusive. Whether you are rich or poor, the homeowner or a tenant, the employer or the driver, as you are in our barangay, we will send you a text blast message. It is two-way communication and residents were engaged. The left um, slide, the left photo shows the text blast which we sent out last March, March 13 to announce the declaration of uh, State of emergency, our president. On the right side is the announcement by is our text blast when the president announced the community lockdown on March 16. That means nobody can go out of our of communities. Second, the barangay did not panic. We did not panic. Because we were prepared, supplies were on stock. Unlike other barangays who had to cram for suppliers for alcohol, face masks, surgical gloves, we just pulled these things out from our blue drums on the photo that, you sh that was shown earlier. We also had funds ready to immediately buy other equipment and supplies needed. Therefore, we were able to disinfect inside and outside homes and streets immediately. These are... Um, uh, screenshots uh, grabbed from Facebook pages of uh, our barangay before and other friends. Face masks were distributed, at least five pieces per family. And from March up to this date, we give free alcohol refill for disinfectant, for disinfecting. 
I think we are the only barangay to be doing this. Um, even in the barangay of Miss Emma, I don't think you are getting free. No, out we yet. don't have what you have, cups. Yes, and there's more. Right. So from that same text, uh, uh, mobile phone, difficult decisions and announcements were made without hesitation. On the left screen is our announcement, our order to close our borders with our neighboring barangay. And on the right, last March 21, and on the right, last March 23, we announced our first COVID-19 case. We transparency. We didn't want to hide any case that we had in the community. We immediately announced it. Third, we controlled quarantine and curfew protocols. We issued quarantine passes and ID cards and the monitored curfew during regulated hours. Fourth, and this is uh, interesting, we creatively served the needs of residents so that they will stay home. We do not want them to go out. So we decided to serve their needs, okay? So the major project here was the first community market and other needs. The president, our president declared a community lockdown in the evening of March 16. In the morning, on the morning of March 18, the first community market for COVID-19 lockdown in Metro Manila was launched in Blue Ridge B. So we had it for, uh, we had it twice a week on Saturdays and on Wednesdays. So residents would can just buy their, um, do their marketing here. So residents were able to safely shop, safety protocols were in place. We also stocked up our little store, our bilihan, with the things that little things that you would uh, need on a daily basis, like salt, sugar, coffee, drinks, soy sauce, soap. We also catered to other needs of the residents, like rice, water refill, baking needs, etc. There was a time, for example, there was a time when the residents craved for coconuts. They could not go out, but they wanted coconuts. We got it for them, but of course they paid for it, but uh, we got it outside and brought it to our community. We also had volunteer personal shoppers on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They would get the list, maximum of 10, item, 10 items, 10 types of items per, uh, per family. They would go to the grocery, get it, and then deliver it to you by late afternoon. Fifth, we took care of community health, whether it was COVID-19 or non-COVID-19. We did not want residents to go to doctors who are in the hospitals because uh, there were lots of COVID-19 uh, cases in hospitals and it was in the, you know, who was actually infected. So we decided to bring the doctors to our community. We have a small barangay health center. So on Mondays, we have an orthopedic doctor. Tuesday, we have a surgeon. Thursday, we have a general practitioner, and Friday, we have a dermatologist. Our barangay ambulance is also on standby, and our barangay staff are trained first responders. That same health, or health center is converted into a barbershop every Tuesday afternoon and into a parlor every Thursday afternoon. Just basic grooming services. No frills, no thrills, no shampoo, no massage. Uh, just basic services so that our residents will feel and look neat. Six, we facilitated important services in situ. Instead of um, residents going out, we also brought the services here. The government gave away food packs four ways. So we got them and distributed them to residents. In cooperation with our homeowners association, the annual vehicle registration was also done here. There was a mobile truck by the LTO, the Land Transportation Office, which came here and it was done um, like a drive-through system. Also the RFID stickers for tollways. So we also did, we also brought the two tollways here in our community and um, cars lined up contactless. Seventh, we shared blessings with friends, the policemen, the firemen, and soldiers. Whatever it is that we had and that we can share, we gave to them because they are also people, the, the same people 
who would respond to us if we need their help. And eighth, mental health is important. This is a photo of our park, where, uh, which Ms. Emma has visited before. We did not want a gloomy environment during the lockdown. So from day one and during the entire um, ECQ, the enhanced community quarantine period from March to June, our park was lighted and music was played from six to eight in the evening. So people can walk out and have some cheer. People also cannot go to church, but our Kawanang Santo Nino group made it possible to continue observance of religious practices safely. So rosary by Zoom. And then there was also, uh, there was twice when the, the pre, uh, we were able to arrange for the priest to go around our streets to give blessings and communion. And just last Saturday, October 31, while most communities were not able to celebrate Halloween, but a guy Blue Ridge B possibly might have had the world's first and only COVID-19 drive through trick or treat. Cars drove through our park. We made a mystical forest and treats were given away. So that is me as a scarecrow. Okay. And nine plus plus, we'd, we've done many other things which we will not include anymore um, in this presentation due to um, time. So what were the results? All efforts contributed to a controlled COVID-19 state or status. As I mentioned earlier, we are number two out of 142 barangays in Quezon City with the lowest COVID-19 cases. Residents self-reported exposure or symptoms. Families and individuals were swapped promptly and discreetly. Today, residents trusted that the identities, identities of the patients were strictly kept strictly confidential and quarantined families were given logistical support for their needs. Quality of life was not diminished even during lockdown. Services were available. And these are just examples of food. Ingredients from our, our community market were transformed into delicious dishes, which residents shared in our Viber group. Restaurants were closed, so this couple decided to have dinner by candlelight using ingredients from our community market. They are enjoying oysters and shrimps. Neighbors got to know each other. This is necessary in disaster management. Instead of cook, just cooking for themselves, they made extra portions and started to sell to neighbors. Just all just in limited portions, like extra portions of 10 or five or whatever that they can cook at home. So they started to get to know each other by selling online. So even this is over the barrier, it was being picked up. A cake was also being picked up. Reuse and recycle was promoted. Our homeowners association organized the seminar, online seminar on tidying up. And after residents tidied up, they found lots of things in their homes, which they did not need. And there's a separate Viber group, Blue Ridge B Garage Sale, where they sold different kinds of items that they had, they did not need anymore at home. And the best part was the community took care of us, of the barangay too. This is just kept on coming, food, accessories, press, personal items, plus alcohol, tent, whiteboards, and many more. They just kept on giving us stuff. Last September 18 to 20, the Barangay staff were quarantined for two days due to a positive COVID case. The community fed us with love. So this was day one, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. And day two, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and stocks. Most of it home cooked by our residents. Finally, this is the, where uh, Blue Ridge Big Breeds comes in. The blue community grew green. It is one of the earlier seeds we planted towards community resilience. So this is our park area, a terrace area, which was empty, dirty, full of weeds before. We had it cleaned up. 
December 15, birth of Blurish B. Breathes, the Blurish Environmental and Agricultural Template for Health, Economy, and Security. Security is for food security. We started to plan. February, we had drills and some vegetables. And by February 20th of 2019, it was Valentine's month. We had a Valentine picnic and we called it harvest time. And the uh, lady in black is our mayor, Joy Belmonte, cutting our first harvest of lettuce. Barter trade, we'll give you vegetables for your recyclables. And of course, you know, Dr. Emma Porio, who was pick picking fresh chilies during her visit to our barangay. We know that our breeds project cannot feed everyone. There's lots of people, but our park is very small. So we gave free vegetable seeds and we sold composted leaves. Leaves um, swept off from our streets are all collected in one compost pit allowed to decompose. And when it's fully decomposed, the texture is soil-like. And the community started to plant. in pots, in their gardens, on the fence. And this is actually uh, the fence in my home, which we started, I think, sometime 2018. And, it is, and we made it as the model of breeds. And now most other people are doing it here. And even by their gate. See, it's pretty. Harvest time, so fruits and uh, some are being uh, cooked already. So these are the ladies of Blurish Bee, where some of the ladies in Blurish Bee with their um, harvest. Okay, so overall, residents feel happy and safe to be within Barangay Blurish Bee. Um, this has been repeatedly expressed by text, by written messages, and by phone calls and personal conversations. They've sent us lots of messages and cards and notes. Before resilience in an urban setting, because the next presentation is rural, so I'm talking about urban setting, I find it to be individual based. It mostly referred to the structural re resilience of individual homes usually confused with convenience at their fingertips because in the cities, everything you need is instantly available if you have money. People do not know how it is to be deprived of this. And there is expectation for the higher government to respond to their needs. Now, COVID-19 forced urban families to deal with resilience as a community. Now they know that it is possible to be stuck with each other, whether one likes it or not. There must be a strong and consistent voice. Helping and sharing is a two-way street. Preparations for any eventuality is a must. Trust and communication are important. We have this uh, bad Filipino habit called Ningas Kugon, and we hope that our residents will remember the lessons of COVID-19 and not fall into this Ningas Kogon trap. Ningas Kogon is when we start something with interest and enthusiasm, it's go, go, go. And then after a very short time, they lose interest and stop whatever it is that we are doing. We hope that we do not fall into that trap. Okay, yes. finally, community resilience is an investment. It is an investment. Ironically, we pray that we are not given the reason to reap its rewards. We pray that we are not given the reason to reap its rewards. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Cap Sesan. Sorry, sorry, I went over time. No, no problem at That's all. great. Like the picture very much thank you yeah. this is an example of the notes we have lots of notes sent by residents so it says to cap sesan and lurish b staff thank you for taking care of us so we have we have received lots of okay this. students know what evidence-based yes. governance means okay. yes so miss emma do you have this thing these services in your barangay no uh, no i should not say cap darwin hayes <laughs> 
tried, you know, one of these favorite uh, subdivisions. So I'll, I'll compare with you. And may I ask for your permission? I'll PDF your PowerPoint and share it with our board. Yes, with please. The board. Yes, Thank please you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank Okay, thank you very much, Capsas. And now we call on our second set of speakers. Um, we, who will be discussing capturing indigenous perspectives and ecosystems-based adaptation inside ancestral domains. This will be led by Ms. Maria Isterluna Luz Canoy, the Executive Director of the Kitanglad Integrated National Government Organizations or NGOs Incorporation in Bukidnon, Mindanao Island, Philippines. She is joined by, with, by Bai Inatlawan, the Head Claimant Chieftain of the Indigenous Peoples Mandatory Representative of Barangay Dalwangan. We now welcome Ms. Easter Luna. Thank you, Ina. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ana, for you for inviting me to share in your course on research management and development, human development. I understand this is supposed to be a field course, but uh, because of the pandemic, that doesn't happen. But uh, I'd like to fill in the gap to excite the students no, from Costa Rica and parts of Asia. Uh, to walk you through to one story in Mount Kitanglad, where you can see all the an application of the uh, ex ex objectives of the course, and we hope that by the end of this presentation, you would have ideas about transdisciplinary uh, social development. You can see many actors, uh, stakeholders, um, partners, and you can see the blending in of uh, scientists and locals and hopefully see the fruits of co-ownership and the bridging work. You know? So this is my presentation. Uh, welcome to Mount Kitang Ladrings Natural Park. Uh, since we're talking about uh, resource management and since we're also tuned in to climate challenges, the climate change adversity, so we're looking at uh, uh, ecosystems-based adaptation, how does nature being taken care of, but interestingly from the point of view of indigenous people. I'm joined by, by Natla one. She was here yesterday. She uh, left a message for the group. Uh, she saw this presentation and gave blessings to be shared because a lot of it's about her community. So welcome to the Mount Kitanglad, the area. And then uh, this is what I designed for your learning. Uh, First, we need to understand there's also a cultural perspective in looking at climate change, uh, the impact, and in terms of communities um, residing in the forest domain. So that's one. Second, you need to understand the principles, the precepts of means of living of these people inside ancestral domains. But since these are also special areas of nature, preserved nature, this also attracted the interest of the state to have it proclaimed as protected areas. You would also understand these changes in land value and land use. And third, you look at the interface of systems and mechanisms because there's protected area, there's ancestral domains. Uh, might be the first time you hear uh, these concepts, but does it really conflict or not? Because some indigenous people they don't really like uh, their areas to be proclaimed as protected areas or natural parks. And then fourth, we need to understand how IPs adapt in this research-rich environment uh, with the use of local knowledge and skills and practices and how this in terms of biodiversity that we want to be preserved, the ecosystem services that benefit not only the of the uh, general well-being of the Filipino, so first, we need to understand the uniqueness of this presentation must be anchored on the local context. So you have, this is a glimpse of how indigenous people, uh, tribes and live and cross culture in Mount Tanglad. So there are survivals of colonialization. They still maintain their identity. So the, in this picture, you can see uh, they're praying. Um, they, uh, they put blessings, you know, a ritual calling for the spirits of nature to say thank you that reached the peak of Mount Kitanglad. But to the ordinary trekkers and mountaineers, they step on this uh, rock altar because for selfie purposes, but they didn't realize that it's actually an altar of the tribe. So that's, uh, 
thing that they need to understand that some the the forests of Monkey Tanglad are actually sacred sacred altars, sacred spaces, or practically the whole mountain range is a cathedral. And second point is, uh, I'll take you to an experience of looking at rich forest areas. That's why it's called the protected area, one of the 10 priority sites in the country, supported by uh, World Bank and the GAF at the start of 1994, when the National Integrated Protected Area System was uh, implemented. So you can see the, the abundant resources, and then when we have nature with us, that's when you can see the development in terms of the economic needs of community, the human development for people to thrive and social development because it holds community. Uh, what is important in my story are the cultural aspects. So we enjoy the mountains, the rivers. These are the headwaters of the Northern Mindanao region. Another view of Mount Kitanglad, if you Trek to the mountaintop of Mount Dulang Dulang. This is the second highest peak. And practically the whole protected area is an important bird area. So inside the home of the Philippine Eagle. So we just celebrated yesterday, we opened the 24th annual Takitang Lodge celebration. That means it's been 24 years that we've worked in, in preserving these protected areas, also an ancestral domain. So, so many peaks and intact forests. And these form as the watershed and the headwaters of important rivers like again the Oro, Tagulan River, Pulangi River, Manup River. recall in the Sendong in Tagian de Oro when the flooding happens. Uh, people in the lowland always look up to people in the uplands like uh, because of the loss of forest, that's why we've been flooded. So, but you have to look at a bigger perspective of landscape. It's not just about the absence of forests. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why also flooding occurs and then it was not possible for infrastructure to support. Uh, you can see also culture here in the next slide. So before Mount Kitanglad was proclaimed as protected area, it is principally an ancestral domain where we have three tribes, the Talandig, Bukidnon, and Higaonan. My work when I started there as an NGO, bridging the government and the indigenous people, and it's interestingly, it's three tribes, Talandig, Bukidnon, and Higaonan. So you have to work with three tribes first before you bring them to government, and for the government to start to listen to the, the aspirations and the needs of the indigenous people. So it's basically a bridging work. But when you have an area protected under the, the night which is part of our policy, which is not, which has already been, um, um, I think they, they, the NIPAS law is already uh, modified into an expanded NIPAS that we have already about 300 plus protected areas, but basically these are the goals. There's biodiversity conservation, there's sustainable development, development. but since uh, KIN as a mediating institution, we look at the value of culture and the indigenous people in the protected area. That's why we added a third objective, which is cultural survival. And that's where our approach matters because we give importance on the people's values and, and tradition. This is the Batasan customary law that we try to promote as part of the rights of indigenous people inside the protected area. So you can see in the succeeding slides that the tribes assert their culture to government, to NGO, to the church, to other partners, because it's basically their ancestral domain. Uh, in some areas, it is a full of conflict, but in Kitanglad, we try to manage the conflict with dialogues, with compromise. We have a multi-stakeholder management body that listens to everyone's concerns. Uh, it may not be perfect, but for 24 years that so we work here, so far, Kitanglad landed as one of the best managed sites in the protected areas around the country. Another concept I wanted to infuse is that since we're dealing with natural resource management, so we're very conscious about uh, are there really nature-based solutions to uh, value biodiversity, ecosystem services. At the same time, we cope up with our economic needs. At the same time, we also need defense against climate impacts, the adversities of climate impacts. That's why the future needs to be an ecosystem-based approach, but one that integrates the combination where you have biodiversity in the equation, the ecosystem services or preserved forests, 
uh, healthy river systems, and the old overall strategy how people cope with the uh, climate uh, climate change. So sustainable, how could it be sustainable if we want a solution that will last, not only according to the terms of office of a uh, public official, but something that really practical and where people can act on such solution. Um, since we talk about uh, transdisciplinary, transformative, uh, human and social development, so we need to be also expand our perception of development. Is there such a thing as development that respects culture? Is this part of the SDG? There used to be an MDG, combating poverty, hunger, disease, but now uh, we're beyond 2015. We have not done significantly on that as a global community. Now it has expanded into 17 SDG goals with considerations already with uh, global actions and country contribution towards mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Key questions, we as a country like Philippines, we are one of the mega diversity in the countries around the world. So we have rich in biodiversity, but we're also overpopulated, rich in people. Uh, can we just implement the SDG or is there a way to look at the SDG with cultural lens? So let's navigate on that. But where is Mount Kitanglad? Um, if you look at the map of Bukidnon, and then that's the Philippines, so we're in northern Mindanao region. So Mount Kitanglad is at the center. It's now a permanent protected area because there's this is the first protected area that has a specific legislation to be a Mount Kitanglad Range Natural Park protected area. And this is actually the goal of other protected areas to be proclaimed a permanent protect, protected area by virtue of legislation. By 2009, so it was a protected area in 2000, but it started as a national park in 1989. So you can see the institutional uh, classification of a forest area. It used to be tribal domain and becomes a national park, becomes a protected area. And in 2009, because of the intrinsic value of the forest and the people and the stakeholders, it was also um, hailed as one of the ASEAN heritage Park, which we can be proud of. Our next goal is actually to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site under the cultural category. You will understand the reason why there's cultural that we want to promote in Mount Kitanglad. And of course, uh, considering the green parts in the map, you can see the Kitanglad, Kalatungan, the Twin Mountains, we call it the Kit Kat. And then uh, there's also this part of Lanao and this uh, Tago, this is the Misamis Oriental Forest. The work of Kin practically captures Kitanglad, Kalatungan, and here in Higaonan areas in other forested mountains in Kimangkil, Kalanawan, Sumagaya, Pamalihi. We also tried to get in touch here of uh, Pantaron. Uh, that's why part previous work of Kin with the IUC and the Netherlands was trying to bridge state initiatives for conservation in Mount Kitanglad, Kalatungan, and Pantaron. We call it the KKP. But why we want this nature and biodiversity conservation be recognized? Because as I said earlier, healthy ecosystems also make people adapt to climate change. So this is another view of Mount Kitanglad. So we understand it's an ancestral domain of the three, three tribes, but it's also a protected area. But we always remember the value of a place in terms of its, uh, how it is served good towards people. Basically, it's a food basket. There's a lot of vegetables, uh, products, agriculture, agribusiness thriving in Makinan. And also, as I mentioned, it's a major watershed. So it's a rain factory. There are lots of rain here. And then because of a protected area, we have uh, endangered species, critical endangered species. The Philippine eagle is also a, a gene pool of biological diversity. A lot of it's still not fully maximized. Uh, we have waterfalls so because it's a watershed. And then when people come to Bukidnon for the first time, they will say they like to stay here because of the full climate and, you know, uh, it's a good environment. And then a healthy soil, that's why uh, agriculture thrives here. And what is also important because of the forest is also a buffer, a protection from climate change. And what is also important to remember are the cultural heritage. Uh, for the last 
two decades, the kin worked as a, a bridging institution to the tribe's government. So this is the whole Mount Kitangla Drains Natural Park. So we have 18 cultural experts that decided, agreed to put into writing their oral traditions. Uh, if we know indigenous people, they are governed by oral customary laws. Uh, in some tribes, these are per forbidden to be written. But basically, multi stakeholder uh, management board, like the Mount Kitangla Area Management Board, since it is already a natural park, how will the tribes convey their rights, their vision, aspiration, if they will not put into writing culture? So since Philippine society needs artifacts, needs evidence, so that's why they had to understand that in the information society, parts of the indigenous sacred customary laws can be open. And the challenge is when it is being written and open, how will government adapt, uh, not approve, but affirm, recognize this indigenous policy that can go hand in hand with state legal, technical policies. So what we are trying to show here is that um, in looking at um, a broad range of development and landscape governance, it should include uh, basic oral traditions of people, basic customary law, even our law also gives recognition to good customs as part of public policy. So this is one example. I take you now to the village of Kainatlawan. She's supposed to join us here, but uh, she called before we started to say uh, hello and wanted for a meeting on Sunday to hear some feedbacks of this sharing. So this is by Natlawan. And then outside of their village at the Heritage Center, uh, you can see something, an altar there. So that's an altar with a flag. So there's a tribal flag. And then looking at the whole spectrum of the Mount Kitangla Drains Natural Park. So you can see on top of that are all really forests. So here they conduct the ritual. So what is very important when I mention about rituals, for the tribes, they are being taught by the ancestors to take care of the mountains because these are sacred. The rivers, the source of life. And then forest is their home, is the church, is their market and currency. You've been hearing about this when indigenous people talks about the importance of forest as an essential foundation of life. So every peak of Mount Ketangla has an indigenous story of legends, tales, how it was named. So that only goes to show the cultural value of this uh, protected area. Can culture go development? So that's a tough question that I asked by Natlawan in 2004 when I, when I pursued my thesis on culture and development. Um, as Bai also mentioned that development without cultures like means losing without the latter, without development. So we cannot have culture alone because we cannot survive. We can accept changes and development, but only those that help us, not make us oblivious of our culture and tradition. So they embrace culture, they embrace development, but that development should preserve culture and respect culture. And in terms of religions, uh, because they also see us, the outside world, as kamu mga kristyano. So they respect other religions. They also have their own beliefs. But in Ba'i's uh, experience where they being told what to do, cer certain decisions over their land. So you can see already the dictates of the states and government and institution about what should be what needs to be done in the inside ancestral domain. So by his, by his words that we're not like machines with a steering wheel where people could just turn where they please, which is true. And then do not treat us like cattle that can be driven away from one place to another. So it happens in Daraguyan that they have been displaced twice before they try to assert their rights inside the protected areas. And in the conduct of rituals, they seek guidance of spirits from nature in terms of daily activities and economic survival. Our sister taught us to get things that are needed and that is enough for their needs. So that's how uh, 
the, the, the importance of principles on resource use that needs to be recognized. Furthermore, in terms of development path, um, they also have a high respect for faith and prayers of other cultures. But what is interesting here, when I asked Dr. Dumapal about development, he couldn't answer me for the local term for indigenous term for development. So I have to give another example, example, example. In our workshop, that's because my thesis is about ethno development. But finally, he just said, like, uh, to him, development is synonymous to pagtabulon. It's the ability to improve a situation that is no longer practical. So you need to change so that that situation will be beneficial to you and to family and to clans. So he gives uh, an example. So like a process of adaptation and coping that stems from simple experiences. He gives an example like fixing a basket. So I still want to make use of this basket, but when I fix it, I'm going to make it bigger because there's 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 harvest so so that's to him is development like you're 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 accommodating a larger harvest for to feed more people so it's also like you fix your farm and then expand it for also a bigger harvest or even you fix your house so the pursuit development is a process that makes lives better and it's something that uh it's like a moving on trajectory of development um since this is an ancestral domain area of uh, inside the Mount Kitanglad, so Bai has a collective title of 4,700 hectares, about 10% of the whole protected area under the ancestral domain title. So when the state recognizes collective title inside the ancestral domain, they're also supposed to come up with ancestral domain sustainable development protection plan. That's a lot of terms. And well, the events of development and how we look at development in terms of social development or development that they will not compromise the needs of the future. But how do you explain such term to indigenous people? So development is like capturing something that represents the deep sacred aspirations of Bukidnon people. So I would say to a lot of groups that adds DPP or that plan is it's not a product of a workshop, please. It's not just workshop. It's walking. Walking. Hearing the aspirations of elders, the dreams of the youths, the joy to Mangungayamo, uh, a tribe ritualist, a midwife. So everything you have that captured. And it's good that our Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act recognizes that the HDPP can be in a form of a poem, of a song, of a chant. So it's not strictly just this stuff, uh, you know, a thick document where, you know, everyone is fond about document, no? Uh, they want very thick documents. Let's go to the realities. Um, Mount Kitanglad also has close canopy for us. In 2005, and then in, in 2013, you can see the difference. The close canopy increased a bit. And the open canopy kind of reduced. Grasslands uh, re reduced significantly. You can see from 4,000 to 1,000 hectares in a span of eight years. Then agriculture, it's competing. But because it's a protected area, the agricultural development is, is more or less regulated. Plantations is wow. You can see from 2005, from 300 hectares, it rose up to 4,715 hectares. So that's the entirety of Mount Kitang land. So this is basically the challenge that you have a protected area, but how come plantations step in? Why? Because plantations and agribusiness wants to be closer to the landscape or forest because it's good for business, because agriculture needs healthy soil, but it's also a challenge in terms of development, because uh, what is the plantation for? How do tribes benefit from this uh, plantation? As you can see earlier from that slide, I just highlighted this one, the altar facing Mount Kitanglad, where they consider it a sacred mountain. So at this point, you would know that the spiritual culture governs the resource use and management in Mount Kitanglad. 
So it's not just a principle of being sensitive to ecosystems. No. From the start, the ancestors taught them respect nature because they are spirits. They dwell, they they exist with us. So there's an interbeing of reality. There's humans, visible, there's also invisible elements. So we're very fortunate that to understand, this is a very organic illustration coming from a chieftain of Mount Kitanglad, uh, the founder of one of the founders of Kin is Datu Mikitai Bitterin Sawai. He needs to come up with a rep representation and framework for the outside world to see the indigenous cultural worldview. Here you can see in the diagram, it's a, a picture of a human being. And then you can see there uh, the functions, the cultural expertise. What do I mean with that? Uh, in the diagram, in the head, you can see it symbolizes faith and religious system. For every community, there's always been an own faith or autonomous or organic faith that emanates from a community. And that's the function of the ritualist. That's what you can see in the at the column at the right, the role of the ritualist. The mouth represents oral literature, oral tradition, history, education, and arts. This is the function of the oralist. They call it uh, gugud, a historian. How about the heart? The heart represents customary law because it deals with conflict, it deals with uh, relationship, it promotes social order, and this is the role of the arbitrator, the adatus and the ba'is. And then how about the stomach, the indigenous health, traditional medicine, that's the role of the healer. And the midwife, they also have traditional midwives. And then for their livelihood, for the economy, they also have farmers, they know how to fish in the rivers, so they promote the life of the tribe. Important, the feet and the arm talks about security. There's tribal warriors, tribal guards. These are also basic right of a community to defend itself against uh, those who would like to invade the community. And then they're stepping, the, the diagram steps on the territory of Mount Kitanglad. So this is a very enriching experience to understand. So when we started in 1997, we are taught that for every community, there's always a ritualist, oralist, arbitrator, healer, economist, you have to find them. But the rule is they, the tribes will not say who is the ritualist, who is the sage in the community. It's up to you to discover your ability to do, to connect to people, for them to build trust so that they will say, oh, the healer is this person. So it's not something to say, I'm the healer. No, that doesn't happen in the community. And then this one is one of the new things that we have, we're able to document in the cultural profiling of the indigenous people. So you can imagine the tribes doing the anthropological work. So they call the local anthro. So they document culture, they profile the culture. And this is something new to share to the world. They look at the pillars of life, the guardian spirits of nature that supports the life of human being, the life of the ecosystems, the life of nature. So uh, these are pillars of life that need to be respected that each of the Datu, a culture expertise, would know. So you are not a, a cultural expert if you don't know the names and the functions of the spirits. And then they also be present in all of creations. No story has been written how they came about nature, but at the beginning of the creation of human beings, they, these nature spirits also exist. And then during the ritual, the shaman, the bai bailan, the ritualist, the talamuhat can invite them. That's why in the, in, the, in the communion part of the ritual, the first part is the offering. So there's the sacrifice of animals. And then there's also offering, there's communion, because you now invite the spirit of water, the spirit of nature, the spirit of land, of earth, the spirit of wind, the spirit of fire, all the nature elements. So what are these spirits of nature? So Ba'i mentioned this, the Talagbugta, the guardian of the earth, Bulalakao, the guardian of the water. Ibabasok for the plants and the trees. And then also like uh, gardens of sounds of thunder. I really don't like just 
name them because these are sacred. And then uh, going to, to other symbols of nature, the guardians of nature, the guardians of the wind, the breathing of the person, and then the lightning, the fire, the sunlight, and amalag, the guardians of animals. That's why uh, even if Kitanglad is not a natural park, the tribes respect the Philippine eagle because if one eagle is killed, it's like tantamount to giving consent for the death of a member of a family. So that's how important biodiversity is to them. And then of course, wisdom and knowledge. So indigenous wisdom are protected. But Datu Makapuko said, the oral chieftain of Kitanglad, there's such a thing as open secret and closed secret. So what we've written in the wisdom keepers of Mount Kitanglad are open secret, but the closed secret are really the profound, the deep spiritual practices of the tribe. So we have not reached that far yet. If you look at livelihood practices in Kitanglad when it was a protected area, what is important, because you can also discern, is this an ecosystem's nature-based solution? Yes, because livelihood activities prescribed inside Mount Kitanglad must pass five criteria. What are these criteria? First, have a livelihood that does not compete with biodiversity. And then second, invite people inside, does not pause in migration. Because protected areas, protected area, the only allowed people to stay there are indigenous people and the new migrant. Third, of course, does not cause pollution. And then four, it will not require the use of heavy machineries or machineries because it's a natural park. And one fifth, what is most important is that it should observe the cultural process. So even if before the IPRA law, there's prior informed consent, but for the tribes, it's already part embedded in their consciousness and precepts. If you want to look at livelihood, so there's still part of it shifting cultivation, but it's regulated, uh, non-destructive farming practices. Uh, they have vegetable production, agroforestry is well promoted here, but we cannot also say no to the poultry, piggery, the plantations, bananas, pineapple, they're all around Mount Kitanglad. Okay, so this is now my challenge to you. Uh, the students of this class. So we are in the context of protected area systems. There are programs, project activities. Institutions that is formal and informal. So like in terms of economics, you have an idea now that for livelihood, it should be non-destructive. It should be NLA. Our training goes for sustainable farming practices, contour farming. In terms of human resource, uh, we train tribes for bookkeeping, project management as part of empowerment. In terms of sociocultural, there's the revival of rituals because in the past, during martial law, the tribes are very afraid to conduct rituals because they are being perceived to be conducting a rebellious activity. But now, with the revival of respect of culture, people are proud to assert culture and then the institutions in the park management institutionalize culture. That's why you cannot climb any point of Kitanglad or trekking without blessing ritual from the tribe. So you must go through an acceptance ritual. You also have tribal practice. This is the gathering of leaders of, it's the summit of leaders uh, of forest. So if you don't have a forest, you're not invited to the Lambaga tribal uh, summit. And then we have the annual Kitanglad celebration. I've mentioned we are on the 24th year of celebration. But since we are in COVID pandemic, so we skip the festivity, the big gathering, but we still maintain the ritual, the tree planting, and the giving out of logistical support to the 350 Kitanglad Guards volunteers. We have Kitanglad Guards volunteers. We also have Council of Elders and People's Organization that are basically 80% Indigenous people. In terms of environmental, we look at institutionalized forest protection. We have KGB since 1997. LG support their honorarium. And part of the environmental measures is cultural zoning workshop. You can see here in the drawing, this is very key in empowerment because we're looking at resources. Uh, this is a 3D map of Mount Kitanglad. You can see Bai there. She's one of those who planned for the application for a title of the ancestral domain, looking at the three-dimensional map. So 
they look at the fate of the area if they will not do something about the green intact forest. So the goal is if it's protected area, it's a tribal protected area, the light green to be become dark green. So zoning is very important process to empower communities to make wise decision on resource management. We bring the 3D map to the waters of Makalar Bay. So we included the coastal areas. And you can see in the picture yeah, at the right side, the dark green part are the natural parks. The light green part, are, you can see all the land use conversion, settlements, agriculture, uh, that puts a threat to protected forests. We've also institutionalized biodiversity monitoring systems. So tribes are trained to monitor the eagle, the critical biodiversity, and make sure that every three months they are reported to be present or any changes that has happened. And any hunting, forbid not for the eagle, that happens, so no squatting also allowed. And then in terms of restoration, we promote rainforestation, the promotion of local indigenous species to expand the, the breadth of uh, forest in Mount Lab. For decision and policy making, uh, the park management really have to recognize the rights of the tribes for their tenure. Some tribes will not say no need for a paper to prove tenurial rights, but for Mount for Daraguyan, they have an ancestral domain title for the 4,000 hectares of their territory. Uh, the, the effect of having a CAD fee is that they have more or less uh, strong uh, authority in the management of the ancestral domain. And they have an ADCP as the basis of planning. Advocacy, this is a lot of kin's work. We promote the rights of tribes inside the protected area. We also promote the other than the state, what is inside, biodiversity, flora, fauna, the forest, our cultural property, the laws of the tribe. And then we also promote schools for living tradition because this is where we promote new knowledge on balancing culture and development. So you can see here the importance of tribal governance in, in the whole landscape governance. So they have Tambi, we have DNR, we have mayors. But the tribal governance, this is now what makes it different, is that they also have a guiding principle. They call it agpangan. If you can see justice, there's a scale. Um, Datu Makapuka calls it the vertical and horizontal balance. The vertical and horizontal balance is also has to follow the framework of agpangan. The scale of justice so is not just tipping the, the, the left and the right, no? from the offender to the victim. Uh, what are rights being entailed because it's not simple like tipping the scale that how come the death of a person can be paid by one horse. So there's also an agpangan framework in valuing. To say sorry will, will amount to eight carabaos. And if you do not appear to the next full moon, the eight carabaos will be translated to times two. It becomes 16. So there's a, not just the scale of justice, but the whole framework. So this is very important to understand. And once we're able to strengthen this one, tribal governance should be part of the democratic governance. If Philippines is truly a democratic country, it should open its door for tribal governance. And we envision that tribal governance goes not just the Philippines in Asia, but also the governance that helps strengthen Mount Tanglad to it is now. So I'm almost leaving to my conclusion. Uh, so the robust forest, vibrant ecosystem is a springboard for human development. What is important when they adapt to the forest domain, they adapt because they're also guided. That's why in activity, they constant and Some people will have, why we have free prior informed and we approach the tribe. The thing is, by explain, it's not me. We introduce you to the spirits of nature that your intentions will be felt by them. To them not sincere and it will be personal. I just one example, illustration of how 
a mountain is reserved like a human. As it has feelings. Because if connected with nature, we can actually call nature. It's also of our gifts as a being. The tribe show us very easily. Uh, this part, the picture here, a military commander. In one instant, he take blood. He had to go through a sorry ritual. How do you way apologize for the community? Colonel Gapos, in turn, was a battalion commander of 400 days. Wanted to be called from the UPR, so he has to order a, a bombing. But in that bombing, he also damaged the forest. And the tribe said, other people are not coming. The officer said, but I'm doing my work. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's in Sunday. But it's not of your Monday to destroy the ticket. And he said, what can I We need to go to the people. In the story, uh, military are in the side of the dogs. The ritualists will call the prison to say, please accept and delete what they've done in the damage that they were doing. So I think he came also as strong spiritual. It's just the development so much of the reason that we don't have to our mistake. But it's part of the solution, the sustainable development solution, that's just I think we lost um sir so I, I think Ina will ask yeah. her to you know record later you know right. and then we'll that's what we'll put in our YouTube sure so, so uh, Miko can you pull the open which is forum. back now we actually have now. Yes, sir, are you back yes I'm here now so I'm gonna okay. uh, oh, please continue I'm uh, gonna leave you the words of Barnat Lawan. Uh, this was recorded yesterday just from my phone. So the audio would be not, not strong enough. But I'll put the meaning of what she's been saying. Uh, okay. Uh, for this, I'd like to hear this. Okay. Okay, let's listen to Bai Enat Lawan's video. Okay, all right. Ma'am Easter, I'll share, I'll play the video for you, okay? Okay, I hope she's okay. Esther? Yes? Yeah. Please play the Gina and... Okay. Sorry about that. And she can... Let's ask her to record this, okay? Okay. Okay. Nakita na ko nga dako ang kabalhinan sa akong kinayahang pagkakaroon. Ang among kultura mo'y among bisaligan ang kanitin sa kanamo kusa wala kit kami maghawa sa Pamaagi, kay maugi among isaligan na makakadipinsa sa COVID, sa katalagman, bagyo o baha, maugi makadipinsa sa amo. Maong na amo binyalimahan ang kulturan mo sa kaaram na pipilid ka namin sa amo sa kitulaman. Okay. Ang among kultura mao'y among bisaligan nga makadepensa kanamo. Kusa wala gid kanimo hawa sa kulturanon nga pamaagi 
kay maugli among kusaligan na makadipin sa sa COVID, makadipin sa sa katalagman, bagyo o baha, maugli ang makadipin sa sa amo. Maong na amo kiting yalimahan ang kulturan ng sa kaalam na kibilin ka namo sa amo sa kitulagan. Okay. What pen? Ina, is that you or from Esther? Ina? That's for me, Dr. Ma. That's for me. Yes, so... Oh, okay. okay. So, Esther will come back. Esther, can you come back and... She's already there. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Uh, so, this is my last slide. This is the whole view of Mount Kitangad. And then below the city of Malay Balay, it's a small city. So it's Esther, I am seeing the picture. Yes. Can you see the picture? Not yet. Can you please show, yes. share screen, show the picture? Okay. Uh, you know? Okay. Uh, it's there. Uh, can you see it? I'm not seeing it. Ina? Um, uh, Ma'am, is there maybe you can stop share first and then you'll you'll share again. Okay. Uh, let me know if she wants me to share for you. Okay. You can also share it from your end. That's the last slide. So basically, we'll come to Malay Balai City and uh, all Mount Kitangla Range Natural Park on the back there. Uh, Ina, can you show it? Because I'm not seeing anything. Are you seeing it now? Yeah. Can okay. you see it now? Okay. No. So that's my last, my last slide. Ina, can you see it? I'm yes. not seeing it. Uh, maybe it's in the reception in your area. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Easter. Um, any uh, last few words to conclude your presentation? Yes. Ina, can uh, you show the picture? The last slide, it, Ina, can you show? It's visible now on my screen. Um, you can see it yeah, yet. It's visible, Ma Ma. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it, Ina. Yeah, Dr. Emma, maybe oh. it's in, the, in your reception because it can be seen. No, by... because it, it says here, Esther Carnoy has started screen sharing. Yeah, but Miss Esther can see it already in her end. Okay. Um, go ahead, Esther. Close, close your presentation. Okay. So um, I'm very glad that uh, I was able to make this presentation about Mount Tanglad. I just like to conclude my presentation that uh, Kitanglad represents an integrated, autonomous, ecosystems based adaptation. It's not a product of any input from anyone, it's something that they live through their lives. So that is very important to remember. And then, if you look at sustainable development solutions, if you're going for sustainable development, to pursue as a way for future towards human development that is balanced, equitable, fair, and just. Uh, you look at the experience of Mount Kitanglad. You need to see the strength or the vulnerability of the ecosystems or the resources. It's all still preserved because of culture. And then there is an integrated adaptation strategies that you can see. They also work with the park management, but basically in what I presented to you, they have their own way of life. But they cannot stop business plantations but what they're trying to preserve are the intact forests because it remains to be sacred to them the entire market is a sacred okay we, we lost her okay. again um doc emma maybe we can proceed without no i think Ina, do the yes. presentation of the picture of mount ketanglad that's yeah. very central to his message her message, yes. okay? Uh, and then third, can I continue? Yes. Okay. Okay. And the third is the, the linkages of institutions. So we have 
cultural institutions. We have the park management institution. We also have the larger government institution. Is there overlapping, interfacing these dynamics? But the the conflicts were resolved because of dialogue. There's a multi-stakeholder body, and this is very important because if you look at the view of a green, safe, resilient future, this is the vision of. Mount Mulad. And this is what the indigenous people, the Kalandig, the Kidnon, Tigang. Uh, we lost again, Inan. No? Yes, we lost. Um, so, so I think we can proceed with the open okay. portal now. Okay. You, um, you can oh. you share the slide for instruction? We actually have already questions from our for our first speaker. Okay. So may I call oh. back um Miss um, Kina? Yes. We will ask her later to record on her own and okay. send it to us, and that is what we will put in our YouTube channel. And that's okay. what we will share with our viewers later. Thank you. Thank you also. Okay. Hi. Hi. So all right. Um, a question okay, to Cap um, yeah. There was one here from the students of the Asian Peace Builders Program, a scholarship program. The comprehensive model used by Blue Ridge B is really great. So she, um, the, um, the students want to ask. Um, maybe Shori, maybe Shori wants to ask it, Ina. This one Shuri is from. Was the one who asked Okay. Would you like to ask it directly to Capsisan? Yes, but I, I think yeah. my microphone is really bad. Can you can you hear me? Okay. okay. I can hear you. Sorry, sorry, Ina. You go ahead, Ina. Sorry, I can Okay. Can you hear me, sorry. Ina? Yeah, we hear you, Shori. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I so many things to ask, but, but I, I have two things for now. I'm really curious about the successful factors in the initiative. And I, I imagine that um, I'm curious about the gender perspective. So I wonder in, in the Philippines, I feel the women initiative is really good. I mean, like the many women, including you and the professors are playing an important role. So. Um, my question is the, the role of women in the implementation or community resilience or community development itself. That is my first question. Okay. And the second question is resource management um, because even though we try to um, improve or promote the community management, we always face the difficulty in uh, financial resourcement, uh, lacking, lack of the financial resourcement and human resourcement. So my question is, how do, how did you make it to fulfill the demand from the people in terms of the financial resource and human resource? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your question, Shari. Um, so you have two questions. The first one is the role of women in uh, in our community development. And then the second one is on the financial and uh, how we manage with uh, financial and human resources. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So in the Philippines, may I just share when I was studying in the UK before for my master's degree in uh, social development, that was way about 1990s, early 1990s, when, my, when I was first introduced to the term gender equality, I cannot relate to it because in the Philippines, um, gender is not really a very, very big issue like in other countries. We still have some uh, gender issues. Anyway, but the most women here have opportunities to participate because they are educated, they can vote. Okay. So at the barangay level, we encourage, no, actually, it's not an issue. Everybody's welcome to join. We have programs for women. We actually have a committee on um, uh, violence against women, but we do not have issues on that. Uh, when we have training programs, if you are fit enough, regardless of your sex or age, you can join. 
um, even in uh, disaster preparedness training programs, we allow women because they might uh, mostly be at home. So they are allowed to participate and their skills will be used when, uh, when it's needed, when disaster strikes. Okay, so actually we have, uh, just show yourself. If you can uh, show, um, wait. okay. Uh, with me is Kagawan Kate. She's the one in charge of uh, gender and development. So it's a very active program. If there's an opportunity, we'll share with you um, next time. And then lack of uh, financial and uh, human resources. As I mentioned earlier, out of 142 barangays, our barangay, Blue Ridge B, has ranks very, very low in terms of budget. While other bigger barangays would have a tens and hundreds of millions of pesos in budget, we just started with around 6 million pesos in 2018. Um, then now uh, we are in uh, 7 million, 7 million. But we do not, but we are able to give more services than other barangays because not a centavo leaks out of our funds. Everything that we spend in the barangay is accounted for down to the last centavo with a receipt. Um, there is a contractor system in the Philippines where um, a contractor will uh, will procure or facilitate your needs, but they get a cut. Usually it's around 30%. But since our budget is very small, we thought that we cannot afford to have 30% of our money leak out. So we painstakingly attend to all documents needed just so we can spend our money 100% on barangay requirements and account for everything down to the last centavo. So in other words, we are, we claim to be corruption free. Thank you. Okay, Tina, are there other questions? I think uh, Thank you. Marina Hosoda also wanted to ask about the finances, but I think Shuri San already took it over. So Ina, can you take over, please? Yes, I have another question here from Lynn, also a student in the class. Um, Lynn, you can pose your question now to... Okay, she says she has some problems with the microphone. So I'll read her question. How about uh, Aya? Uh, maybe we can read Lynn's question first. Um, Lynn, Captain Lin's question is the comprehensive model used by Blue Ridge B is really great. And she wants to ask if this has been, if we would you know if this has been replicated to other barangays as well? Um no. Um, um last we have a disaster preparedness plan. So it's it was just a plan. And uh, although we were very small, we had the guts to present it to Congress last um, in uh, last November um, 2018. And I think that's where um, uh, Ms. Emma- Yeah, I saw you. Yeah, found us. We were um, seated, seated alongside many big companies and uh, government agencies. And we were this tiny barangay, but we knew we had a plan that can work. Our intention was let people know, and then we are much willing to share it with other um, near barangay, other barangays. Our theory is if we are prepared and then our neighboring barangay is prepared and everybody gets prepared, then it will be better. Because if you are the only one prepared, your neighboring barangays will prey on you, will take advantage of your preparation. So that's not going to be safe. So we were able to present also to the class of Miss Emma, and they're very happy. And then now this is not just a plan. Before it was just a plan. Now this was something tested already. Our plans, our preparations were tested already. And we know that it works. It will work. We just need to put in a lot more effort. So the next step is if there are other barangays who would be willing to 
listen and try it out. It's not easy, but it is possible. It's not rocket science, nothing rocket science. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Aya Fujimoto, also from us, who has a question as well. So, Aya. There we go. Hi. Aya. Thank you so much for your presentations. It's good to hear, like, actually, it's great to hear the positive example in the early morning. That's made my day. <laughs> Um, so my question is um, similar to theory, it's uh, gender issues. Around the world, under lockdown or COVID-19, we are seeing like existing gender issues has worsened because of like, uh, such as limited access to care work or uh, domestic violence, etc. So I wonder, are there any you know, gender-related issues worsened by lockdown or COVID-19? I'm not talking about women only, but maybe also gender minority people or any related you know, like influence to gender roles. And if so, did the community handle anything to tackle those issues? Thank you. Thank you very much, Aya, for your question. Um, it's that uh, I know that the uh, gender is a very big issue, but in our barangay, especially during this pandemic, it did not really pose any problem or was not even a matter discussed. Everything, whether you, um, whether um, uh, whether it's COVID related. If you needed assistance, um, if you cook, the, sun, the women are leading. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, men in our market, the men and women do the marketing, or sometimes the women do the marketing and the men cook at home because everybody's at home. Um, or sometimes the men, I, I just showed you photos of the women, of the ladies in Dorishby planting but there were actually men who were planting. Unfortunately, they just did not uh, send in their photos. They shot, they just sent in their plants. Um, any? Ah, yeah, there were no issues. We treated, everybody was treated equally and availed of our services equally. We're very happy that uh, gender did not pose any problem during this uh, pandemic, during this lockdown. Thank you, that's also great to hear, like, yeah. you know, gender equality. I, I know the Philippines is much more advanced than Japan, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, wait, just to add, I might be, well, female, but because I'm the leader here in the Arbarangay, I am very, I can be soft, but I can be very tough. Um, it, uh, so, so far there's respect and trust and they follow and they cooperate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cap Sessan. And thank you, Aya, for that question. Um, I, I'd like to know if Ms. Easter is still in the room. I think um, she, we, she's yes. back, you know. Yes, we can pose her one one question um, about youth in the in Mount Kitangland. How are children and youth involved in promoting and enriching cultural practices in relation to taking care of their environment and natural resources in Mount Kitangland? Um, thank you for the question. I mentioned about the, having a school for living traditions. So the community of Bai has their own tribal school, and it basically like preschool to learn about culture. And um, but what is very interesting in a community life, everything is done live, real time. When there is a ritual, even the children can participate and witness. If everyone offers, the kids will also offer. They will hear the prayers. You will see the actions of elders. So it's really discipleship. 
that eventually among the broods, among the siblings, one will rise. The one which has the rightness of aura will assume the next role of a leader. So they're very, very um, cautious about the growth of children. So that's why it's also, it was also a decision of Datu Makapukau to do a cultural profiling. Because the kids went to school, there's nothing on culture uh, that was written about them. And so many words of wisdom they, they can hear from the elders, but how come it's not written? So I think we're still um, need double time in terms of dissemination of cultural stuff uh, with my cultural curriculum. So we have the youth leading designing the curriculum. Now that we are online and they're looking at sample materials and modules, and they're building their own, they're creating their own. So they're very, very receptive. Kids' work is not limited to elders, to women, to the cultural experts, to the farmers. We also include kids, not only youths. So we even have activities wherein the kids, they also have their own uh, recycling workshop because they're, they're, they're at home. So we need to tap their creativity. So we need to be, as a community worker, we have to recognize the aspiration, the needs, the enthusiasm eagerness of every member of the community. I fully agree with that, um, Ma'am Easter, and thank you very much for your response. Happy to hear that. And also, please extend our gratitude to Bai Inatlawan and her, her video in, the, in your presentation. I see one more question here from Joy. She's also a student from in the Asian Peace Builders Scholarship Program. Joy, would you like to pose your question to our speakers? Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Both of the topics are very interesting. Um, when I listened to the presentation from um, from Capsefa, I, I have a question on in the terms of the urban design because, um, like to to have a solidarity from the community for for me, I can imagine that is it cannot happen just like in 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 one night like when you announce the lockdown and and that what we call the bond of the community doesn't you know happen in one day. So I would like to know like how the community was designed before the COVID nineteen and how the context of the urban sustainability or city designs contribute to the community of um, Blue Ridge. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much Joy, for that question. Um, um, before... I think Joy is, are you still in Joy? Or you're now back in your country? Yes, I'm now Hello, back in my country. Yes, I'm in Bangkok right now. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Joy. Before COVID-19, none of this existed. In our disaster um, preparedness plan, it included and very specific that we wanted neighbors to know each other. Our barangay, Barangay Blue Ridge B, has mostly, um, we have a small depressed area but mostly the houses are big and gated, fenced off. So only a few neighbors knew each other. Not everybody, like I would admit, I did not know everybody in our barangay. Um, there would only be a groups of friends, um, people who just settled in would not know the other residents. So in our plan, we wanted people to know each other. So our programs before were, we had bingo socials where we clustered everybody. We had, we created opportunities, events, activities before COVID where people can come and meet each other. But before we came, people were not even joining activities in the barangay. So we really had to think of creative ways to make them come out of their homes, join and participate and get to know each other. Like the, um, like the um, heart vest time um, that we showed you where the, our mayor is cutting the, of making the first cut of the um, lettuce. We had the community picnic 
we've never had a picnic in uh, in Blue Ridge before, or we've uh, will organize disaster preparedness trainings. We'll uh, bring the fire truck here and uh, allow people to see or ride on the ambulance uh, on the fire truck or the ambulance. We'd make it interesting so that people will come out and know each other. But that was not yet enough. People, people, many people came out, but the others were not yet coming out. And then with the text blast system and the Viber group in the community with the COVID-19, people understood that we were stuck with each other, what, for eight months already? We had to know each other. We had to like each other. We had to help each other. So now I know more people, even by face. I call them, they call me. Um, neighbors would also know each other. So uh, that is one of the blessings of uh, COVID-19. We were forced to know each other. So when the bigger disaster comes, but hopefully it doesn't, we can help each other. Oh, and but I forgot. In our disaster management plan, we, it was important for us to know each other because we wanted to, it was supposed to be in um, houses would be clustered and then there would be body system. Like if we are, um, if I am neighbors with Joy, if I am able to come out of my house, I'll check on you. If you and your family were was able to come out or if you were able to come out and you have not seen me or my family in the street, you will check on me or report to the authorities, to the barangay that my family has not yet come out. So there's cluster and there's body system. That's the plan. We are still moving towards that, but it's good that we've made the first step of people knowing each other. Thank you, Joy. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you, Kapsa San. Um, I see another question here from the from Marina. Marina, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, is the internet okay for her, Miss yeah. <laughs> Esther? Would well, she be okay to answer? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. So thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the um, your first approach when you interact with the uh, indigenous people or the community, because no matter we tried, we cannot be the person who lived there. We are always outsider. So I just want to know, like, if you go to the patriarch to talk first, or you find a key person inside the uh, indigenous community like that, I would like to know your approach. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for taking a question in building community work. Uh, first, you must have a good reason why you need to go to a community. Because I, for me, when I work with, uh, before I work uh, in the environment, I was basically an ecologist. So my role was really to find people, discover culture, uh, where they are in remote forest areas and uh, what facilitates because sometimes there times you're alone you go to the community but what is just the simpler ones uh if you are interested in a particular community you have to find the link and mostly in the 80s the link was coming from the church workers because this will have tribal shows. So in Bolshan, they already know the people there. Uh, so you need to kind of uh, connect with them. And I started actually as a volunteer. So uh, this is a principle that I carry on with NGO Akin, that it was volunteer. So when you volunteer, you are there for the community. Uh, you're there to help you to understand first. You don't, you don't, you don't impose to help. Because you need to understand their concerns, their needs, their aspirations. And then you have to think that the concerns, aspirations also listen to you. Be a connection. Because the tribes are very, very sensitive. So they can sense pretentiousness. Uh, so this can also sense uh, malice with your intentions. 
And it's very interesting because like with Jane at Lawan, when I was uh, going to see her to ask help for a problem, before I arrived, before I arrived, I'll come to think of it. Before I arrived, Bai said she was supposed to go to the mountains, but she did not because she had this. Ina? I think we lost her again. Uh, okay. Um, it's a, can, if, yes, you know, one. later on, if we can have, um, if, if she can, but I think, let's, um, okay. Okay. Uh, so to continue the story, she already saw my spirit guide coming to see her, telling her that just wait because I'm coming. So I was surprised when she told me that I know there's a problem. Uh, your spirit guide was already ahead, advanced, telling her to wait. And then when I had this experience, I knew somehow that, wow, so this spiritual, uh, spiritual belief of the tribe is very strong. And I'm very also drawn to that because I believe that there's a lot of the invisible elements and to know them, they're not taught in schools. It is taught by intuition. It, it is a light bulb moment because you can recognize presence of what is, you know, you can feel people with good aura. So there's something there. So in fact, when I even expressed my intention to do my thesis. So I knew the coin 12. Uh, you have to present a plot and then you have a coin because the coin symbolizes your truth. So if you're going to ask questions, so you place it on the clock and then let's say, Bai, is it okay to consult your spirit guide? Because the tribes believe we all have spirit guides and our spirit guides connects us to nature. So that's why you can understand some people, their, their passion is really diving, taking care of the marine, save the corals because their element is very strong. Their element connection with water is very strong. Those with working with environment for, you know, forest protection, maybe the earth element is strong or fire or, you know, fire with the sunlight, the sun. So there's a lot of wonders, but you need to have an open mind. And, you know, the, the cup of wisdom is not full. Meaning to say, even if you come from school, don't pretend you know everything. When you enter ancestral domain and tribal areas, Treat the place with respect, and it's easy to gain trust if you have that kind of governance and presence impact to other people. Sir, uh, I think uh, to all the viewers and listeners, I think we'll work, as my staff will work with Esther to have a, you know, recording and edit the things before we will put it in our YouTube channel. So, because I think Esther had many insights about the indigenous people's resource management strategies that I think you will appreciate. Okay, closing. Do I have to close now? Hello. I think we've lost Ina also. Okay, uh, let me close because we're running out of time. So thank you very much, Kapsi San. It's always a joy to listen to you and be inspired to initiatives. Esther, yeah. Esther, I learned a lot. I, I would really want to have a deeper uh, session with you, maybe sometime in March for our Gender and Climate uh, uh, Lecture Series for the Women's Month. You know, you have your dogs yeah. in your background, and I have my construction of construction of the people here in my background so i was well i was listening yes. to esther i was thinking oh my god the dog wants to participate in the <laughs> seminar but but uh, so anyway yes. so thank you very much esther and cap I, 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 yeah yes, so thank you also to my students to the students in asia pacific uh, asian peace builders program for your insightful questions uh, it is through this participation and responses that, you know, our seminars work. So I encourage you um, tomorrow when we, you know, to do the same. So thank you. I always say this, what we do works because of the goodness 
and the generosity of our speakers and our partners at the Asian Peace Builders Program, um, University Office of, of University and Global Relations, like Father Joey and Isa, and also the Department of Political Science, like uh, Dr. Um, Diana Mendoza and Oliver Tana, and of course, their secretary. And also, um, the, at the, our partners at the Nippon Foundation, and then, of course, our School of Social Sciences, Dean, Dean Nandi Aldaba, no? he was the one who called me in June, if I can share community partnerships with the Asian Builders Program. So I'd like to thank Nandi, uh, Diana, Oliver, and um, our chair, Dr. Joel Kanodai. So um, last but not least, I'd like to thank our partners at the National Resilience Council. Um, at the closing plenary on November 12, Fritz, Ohio State University. She is also the former president of the International Sociological Association Clinical Sociology Division. And she will speak on community interventions for environmental resilience because she is, she is sitting there in the US Environmental Protection Agency as um, academic representative. And this will be capped by a presentation by Antonia Yolo Loisaga, President of National Resilience Council, on our National Resilience Scorecards initiatives with the local government unit. So, maraming salamat to all our webinar participants in the FB Live. Uh, thank you for for sharing the morning. You can hear the construction at the back, the high rises. You know, my my internet connection is is sometimes become unstable because of the so many high rises. So many high rises that are sprouting up in the moon. So that's really, they do not progress in the city. Also challenges our resilience initiative. So our pol air pollution, our noise pollution and the like. So. Thank you. I mean, I'm very sorry to have all these noises in the background. But until tomorrow, tomorrow we will have at 9 p.m. we will have um, the Chula Longkorn Center for uh, Peace and Conflict Studies. And of course, the Chiang Mai University, they have a very vibrant and dynamic resource center where they have been doing work, Professor Chayan and the International Rivers Association, they've been doing work around the Mekong River. So thank you very much, Kapsistan, Esther, and thank you very much uh, for all our participants in the FB Live. We will now close, Ina will close this for the public so that the speakers will have a special time with, uh, with the scholars of the Asian Peace Builders Program. So Ina just presented there the link to the evaluation and your comments, okay? So we'll see you tomorrow all in FB Live and those who are with us in Zoom. I'm very touched that somebody from Agosan del Sur who is a Manobo Dawa Baunon, Manolo, if Manolo, if you're here, he basically messaged that he was very happy as a Manobo de Baunon that he, we are being, Esther is uh, sharing with us their initiatives at Mount Kitanglad. So thank you very much and we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Same link, okay. Thank you. Okay, Kapsisan, Esther will now have a session with our scholars. Okay, hello guys. Uh, oh, Mary, you're here. Uh, bon Pierre is online. Okay, so uh, 